need to do a dot to color curve with yep. it. Yep, and there. Okay, okay. and we should uh, and then do some stripes. Maybe with hair check and then we can check all the mm -hmm. colors in. Your pink and green. Pink and green, so we're matching you now. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so we need a lot of false color. <coughs> okay, so we can uh, pull those away. <coughs> 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 okay, you guys rolling? Yep. You ready? Yep. Yeah. Charlie Plum interview take two. Hey, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, my, my time is your time, so I'm happy to do this. I'm, I'm pleased that you're putting this all together. <coughs> so one of the things that, that I want to look at, and I don't think that, let's see, one of the advantages of being a kind of historian is you can see things in other people's experience they don't necessarily see. Sure. Um, and I've lived with this, these stories long enough that I'm beginning to understand something that is really perhaps is not so evident to you. And, and if, if you'll, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I wouldn't say that the military fosters entrepreneurial endeavor. It doesn't foster creativity. It, it is a incredibly efficient organization because everyone looks up the line and down the line and falls into place, figures out where they are in the system. And creativity comes out of accident, disruption, and how we adapt to that. And one of the things of the that is so outstanding in the story of the the, the Hanoi prison camp, the Vietnam prison camp, the overwhelming creativity. You guys learned how to maintain military organization, and yet you each were called upon to foster creative out-of-the-box thinking. You sit in front of the, an experimental aircraft that you fly. You have uh, 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 the <coughs> sitting out there, and a VW bus that is classic. You live a creative life. You inspire thousands and thousands of people, really, with your work. Many of those things, I believe, in part are possible through the experience you went through. That if we could examine for a moment, because one of the things that leaders, great leaders, figure out, Stockdale was terrified when he rewrote the military code. Mm -hmm. He was terrified he would be court-martialed. Mm -hmm. So how do we walk the fine line in the military of followership? Because <coughs> that's what makes it work. <laughs> and yet, if we want our leaders to be inspired leaders, to be able to see outside the box, to be able to think outside the box, there are also ingredients here at play. And I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I want to explore. Uh, it's an interesting thought, um, and um, I'm not sure I agree with all, all of your uh, premise, but clearly the military or education in, in, it, in and of itself stifles creativity. You know, that's what, to me, that's what education is about, is learning to think in this box, and creativity is getting outside the box. And it was, uh, it, it was certainly a change of pace when they made the transition from a very strict, disciplined military into the prison camp where we had to be creative just to survive. Uh, communication is, it was probably 
uh, I mean, one of the most evident um, and, um, it, 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 and maybe humorous um, ways we communicated and, 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 the, and the way, the, the, the way that, that we actually use the creativity for our own benefit. Now, how do we come up with that? Well, that was necessity. You know, that, that, was, uh, uh, that was survival. We had to communicate. We had to connect. The, and, and so we went to great lengths in, in doing this, in, in contacting the guys. And of course, the tap code was our, was our primary method and ways that we used the tap code. <clears throat> we had lots of other ways that we communicated. Um, the, you know, chopping wood uh, outside or even sweeping, if we would sweep outside, we would sweep in the tap code. We would write notes on pieces of toilet paper in ink made from ashes or brick dust and wrap the, the note around a rock and we would heave that rock from one building to another. We call that airmail. <laughs> we, when we couldn't, when we, we didn't have a common wall uh, that we could tap and, and, and uh, use some kind of an audible communication, we, ha we used hand signals. Now, we didn't really know the deaf mute code and so we made up our own, you know, that we could see. So A was like this, and a B looked like a B, and a C looked like a C, and a D was like that, and, uh, or maybe it was like that, and um, an H was like that. <clears throat> and so you tell a guy a joke, and he would just go, <laughs> fun things. Um, but it was that kind of creativity. Now, one of the, I mean, one of the reasons for the creativity is we had nothing else to do. And when, when, I, when I tell people about the clock that I made, I made a clock in the prison camp out of wire and string and a rock that ticks and talks and <clears throat> has a little escape mechanism on it. And, uh, and, and, and people say, how in the world did you ever come up with that? You know, how, how could you possibly do that? I learned to write calligraphy in the, in the prison camp. Now, my father always wanted me to write calligraphy, and I had no interest at all, but he, I knew the strokes. So I got into prison camp, hey, I got all this time on my hands, now I can follow my father's wishes. Will he be proud of me when I come home and I can write calligraphy? But I had no pencil, I had no paper, I, I had no way to practice this. So I made an Etch-a-Sketch, <clears throat> and I can tell you how to make an Etch-a-Sketch. Take a piece of wood and you rub on that piece of wood for about three months, okay? So you better get started. Uh, and then you put earwax on the wood. And, uh, and you take a, a, a stick of bamboo and you hone it down to a, 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 a kind of a chisel edge, okay? And then you can write and then erase it and write some more and erase it and write some more. And that's how I learned calligraphy in the prison camp. So, <clears throat> We had all kinds of, of crea creative ways to do this. We had, we had no clock. We didn't know what time it was. We had no calendars. We couldn't tell what week or what month. <clears throat> we had no uh, measuring device. We didn't have a yardstick or a ruler. And, and we didn't know what a pound was. And I mean, ironically, when you don't have these things that everybody has on a daily basis, <clears throat> you kind of... I don't know, you kind of need to be able to measure things. So we established what we call the POW Bureau of Weights and Measures. <clears throat> and so we found ways to measure things. Uh, I mean, w w one of the things was just, you know, how long is an inch, how long is a foot? And so we would, we would measure a guy and, and we knew how tall he was when he came into the prison camp. Of course, our ejection, and in, in nearly all of us, uh, had to eject from an airplane before we were in the prison camp. And so uh, the ejection shortens a guy, you know, as much as an inch. It compresses the spine. You know, you got like 16 Gs coming up on your butt in an ejection sheet. You grow back, you grow out of that. <clears throat> but it was, in, in fact, it was kind of a fun thing on the ship when somebody would eject and uh, be recovered, and we'd come back, and the first thing we do is measure the guy, and, and he was shorter, you know, than he used to be. <clears throat> but you grow out, you, you know, the, the, your vertebrae expand, uh, uh, and so you grow out of that. 
So, but that's the way we found a POW inch. Um, I developed uh, a, a, a thermometer in the prison camp uh, because we couldn't tell what the temperature was. Well, there was a light bulb that hung from the ceiling in this particular cell that I was in, and there must have been probably eight or 10 feet of a twisted pair of wires that came down to this light bulb. And um, I looked at that, you know, again, nothing else to do, you know, laying back on my board bed, looking up at this light bulb. And I, you know, I'm thinking that pair of twisted wire, when it gets warmer, it's got to expand. And so it unwinds. And when it's cooler, it contracts. And so, and so I've got a rotating light bulb there depending on the temperature. It's a natural. I, I, uh, I, I took a little uh, a bit of dirt and uh, made a little mud out of it and I threw it. It took me a while to throw it at this light bulb and I finally got it to stick on the light bulb. So now when the light bulb would turn, I had the, the shadow of this dirt was on my floor and it was like a vernier, you know, it, it, it would go back and forth. And so I marked off what I thought was going to be, you know, here's, here's 80 degrees and here's 70 degrees and I marked that off and, I, and I, that, that, that became the, the, uh, the temperature sensor for our POW Bureau of Weights and Measures. <clears throat> but back to creativity. And, and, and uh, it, it really was incredible the things that we came up with. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is there's so much in the back of your mind that you never tap into. And, <clears throat> and so guys would lay back on their board bed and just think about a topic. And, um, and then they would teach the rest of us the topic. Uh, Joe Milligan uh, had gone through college and had a biology course. I had never studied biology in, in college. And so I, I was really interested. And I lived with Joe, and, and he taught me his biology course. And it lasted about five days. That's all he could remember about biology. He communicated with some of the other guys and laid back on his bed for about, I don't know, maybe an hour a day just thinking about bio uh, biology. I, then I lived with him five years later, okay? Now his biology course went six months and it was everything from protozoa to metazoa, <laughs> every, everything in between, just because he had tapped into his brain and figured all of this stuff out. Uh, so. So that was, that was part of the purpose of the creativity. Now, the, the, I mean, the, the, the point is that if education stifles creativity, then why in the prison camp could we come up with this creativity? <clears throat> and, and, uh, and the answer is, I think, the necessity of it all, and then the fact that we had the time to do it with, with nothing with no other interference. When you consider the number of inputs that the average person has in a day, all right, with the sounds and the sights and the colors and, and, the, and the phone and, the, and all this stuff goes, in, there must be hundreds of thousands of inputs into our mind. One of the biggest um, challenges at first and then opportunities uh, a second was we're thrust into this scenario where we have no inputs there's nothing happening. You, the biggest part of your day might be you heard a bird, you know, outside your prison cell. And so it all goes internal. Everything that you sense uh, has to come from inside, from, from, from your brain. Okay, so you start making up stuff and you start going back through your life. And, uh, and, and, and trying to remember every book you'd ever read and every, every teacher you'd ever had, every girl you'd ever dated, you know, you thought a lot about this stuff in your life. And, uh, and, and, and you put kind of a, a biography, an autobiography together just in your mind. Uh, and, it, and it was very therapeutic, you know? It, it, it gave you something to think about. It took me about three months, as I recall, to remember every uh, every day of my life in memory. It was from the time I, I was four years old up to the day I was shot down, and I had that autobiography in my mind. When I, when I would 
accidentally come across some memory that I didn't have in that first three months, it was, it was like seeing an old friend again. You know, it was like watching that movie one more time or singing that song one more time. It was, it, it was a joyous experience to think about something that I hadn't already put in that memory bank. Um, and, 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 I could, and, and I could spend hours just trying to remember, you know, what was the color of that dress? You know, what was the, what was the word that I'm missing in that poem? And uh, so uh, cre creativity was vital. Uh, how, how it fits in today's world with all of our busyness, I think to me, that's, that, that, that's part of the value of meditation. You know, you stop, you know, you stop all that stuff from coming in, into your mind. You, you, you stop these senses and just go internal. Listen to your breathing, you know. <laughs> Think about black screens, you know. Just, just you try to simplify your life and that stimulates the creativity. young people today coming up now raised in the era of cell phones and everything else, the constant data stream. Mm -hmm. uh, the inability of I go into restaurants with friends, we sit down to eat yep. and they immediately pull out the phones and they just yep. sit there and do an hour. And I'm yep. Like, yep. But we're here. Yep. And what you begin to recognize is there's an inability growing in our culture, an inability to be alone with oneself. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying and also be put in a statement to, you know, you want to learn to be a leader, you're going to have to know yourself. Yep. That's the core of what goes on. Some part of Bob Shoemaker found his way to himself when he reached out to you. He had a mm -hmm. self that he was, he wasn't broken completely. He was, you know, and even though he had tried to take his life on, on some level, he had gone through that crucible in those two years, and he was bringing that self to Mm -hmm. How do we get to know that? <coughs> and I think you're in a unique position to give that message. Think of a room full of Naval Academy, you know, midshipmen mm -hmm. here, thinking about why to be a good leader, what what is what's it take to be a leader, or, or should I be a hard ass or anything else? They may not think of take 20 minutes a day or half hour a day or 45 minutes a day, shut off your phone. Mm -hmm. See what you find out. So if if it makes sense to you, sure. Make that. Okay. <clears throat> so the value of solitary confinement, or the value really even in a prison situation, is that all the external uh, senses are pretty much shut off, and so you go internal. And so there's great value. In being uh, in, in internalizing because you learn to know yourself. And it's vital, I think, as a leader, you have to know yourself before you can actually um, communicate or affect the lives of anybody else. Um, and so there's something very, um, very stimulating, and it builds a lot of confidence when you know yourself, and then you can reach out to other people because I know myself. Now, it's really difficult in today's world where we've got thousands of things to do and we've got the media is blasting us all the time, our cell phones and the TV and the radios and everything is going on. But I am convinced that to know yourself, <coughs> you, you, you have to work at it. It's, not, it's really not very comfortable at first. And it wasn't for us, for sure. You know, being alone for the first time, I mean, we, you know, we are jet fighter pilots, you know, we're running around doing our tails on fire. It's, uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience. And making that trans transition, it was painful. I mean, I remember the first morning I was in that prison camp. Uh, sure. <laughs>
remember the first morning I was The first morning I was in that prison camp, I, I tried to figure out what time it was. Oh, I remember what it was. <laughs> Shoemaker had told me that church call was five coughs. <clears throat> now, I didn't know what that was. But what he was saying was a signal for that we were all going to go to church on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> So Bob Shoemaker passed along from, from the rest of the cell block that church call is five coughs, all right? And I didn't know what five coughs was, but I didn't want to sound stupid, so I said, Roger, church call, five coughs. And I figured that what that meant was church call was going to be Sunday morning, and they would let us out of our cells, and we'd all collect in the prison yard, and we'd all sing and pray and do religious things. And I, I was looking forward to this. And uh, so that morning, the sun came up. I knew that. Um, and I waited and waited and waited. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, it must be, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Well, it must be noon. I must have, I, 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 when are they going to let me out of here? A guard came in, and I saw his wristwatch, and it was 7 a.m., that my, the time warped. It just, everything went so slowly in that prison camp. Well, he, he finally left, and when they cleared the area, then I heard these <coughs> five coughs, and that was the signal that, that everything was clear, and you could you'd go to your knees in prayer without the fear of being caught by a guard. But, uh, but the point was that... Uh, that time alone, uh, he, he, at first in the prison camp, was painful. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be by myself. You know, I, I got things to do. I got, you know, stuff going on. And I think it's true in daily life, is that if you're going to be a leader, you got to get to know yourself. And what that means is you got to discipline yourself to spend some time with yourself. And that. The discipline thing is, is, is kind of an interesting feature, too. My father, again, would tell me on an early age, he said, because he was a, you know, he was a greatest generation guy. He was a World War II guy. And um, he, he would say, you know, um, self-discipline gives you options. And I didn't understand that because I'm thinking, Self-discipline is when I restrict myself to something, you know. It's when I uh, confine my actions or words or something to a, a, a set of rules. That's discipline to me. How can that give me the freedom of, of options? And so, and I found that to be true, especially in the prison camp. When you discipline your mind, uh, when you discipline your body, when you do the the push-ups and the sit-ups and, and, and go to the gym, when you discipline yourself, then that gives you more freedom than you would have had had you not had the discipline. So how does that fit into to, uh, solitude uh, or going into yourself or the fact that, <clears throat> that to know yourself, you have to be with yourself? It takes discipline to do it. Uh, it takes discipline to shut off your cell phone. It takes discipline, you know, to... Uh, to go into a room and shut the door with nothing else going on. I mean, I, you know, I try to clear my mind of things and it works for about 30 seconds and then stuff starts f flowing in and I can't, I can't do it. Um, and, and so, but I think that's certainly a, a, a great tenet of leadership is to be a good leader. You have to first know yourself. And to do that, uh, you have to, you know, you. You, you, you have to be by yourself. Because I want to get some, a little bit of uh, dialogue to go with some of the images we're also shooting in the B-roll. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Sam Johnson was quoted as saying, freedom has a taste to it for those who fight and almost die, but the protected will never know. Mm -hmm. Why do you go mountain biking and when you're up there, does it ever occur to you where you come from and what it, what an extraordinary difference it is? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mountain bike alone. I don't go in the herds uh, that a lot of guys do. I prefer I prefer that because I get I get the most creativity. You know, I, I I think about things on that mountain bike that I don't think about when I'm with people. Um, I find trails where I can't see anyone else. I can't hear anything else. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't wear earphones, you know, I don't listen to music or, I don't, you know, I don't listen to TED Talks or anything else while I'm biking. I am totally by myself. And it really is surprising the things I come up with that, uh, that have nothing to do with mountain biking, you know, but the things that, uh, that just ruminate in my mind that pop out when I'm alone. And so... <clears throat> And so, uh, you know, while I'm writing, obviously, it's, it, 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 it's wonderful surroundings. You know, I'm looking at the, the trees and, uh, and, and, and the road ahead and, and, and all of this. But the very, the, you know, the big value to me uh, on that mountain bike is that I have solitude. I can be alone for a little while. Be careful about doing that. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll point to it. Cause okay. I Uh, you also have an appreciation for time. Uh, you own a, a 1967 Ford Mustang. They came off the assembly line with the baby in the background of a new Jewish background. Why is the talk about the Mustang, talk about what it means to <coughs> you, talk about time? Um. Time to me, obviously, is very valuable. And, of course, <laughs> I picked up on that in the six years of time that I lost. And, obviously, the older that I get, the more valuable time is. Because, in essence, that's really all you've got. You know, all you've got is your health and your time. And uh, it, 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 nothing else is going to make much, much difference if you don't have one or the other of those. So, um, so I... You know, I, I look at things that remind me of that. And one of the things that remind me of the value of time is my Mustang. Uh, we call her Molly. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it was my son. My son and I put that together. Okay, and he, he decided to call the Mustang Molly. I think it was one of his girlfriends at one time or the other. But we rebuilt that thing from, uh, from a piece of junk, actually. It was that... That car came off of the assembly line the very week that I was shot down in 1967. It's a 1967 model Mustang. The owner watched the car uh, and, was, and went to Detroit and was, it was delivered right there. Watched the car come off the assembly line and we bought it from the owner. Okay, so it has this, this history of a single owner of this, this antique car and so and they get a lot of pleasure out of driving around. You know, there's no power steering, there's no power brake, there's no air conditioning, you know, none of the things that we think of. You know, you you don't have a, you don't have the video of when you back up. You know, and you don't have uh, all of the accoutrement that we normally have when we drive in a car. <laughs> but um, it's really fun to get back in that thing, and you feel like. More than any car I drive, I feel like I'm a part of that, of that car. And same with my airplanes, you know. I, I choose airplanes that I can strap into and feel like I am part of the airplane. That it's not a machine that I am directing, it's me, you know. It's, it, I'm, I'm the wing, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm, uh, and, and the same thing with the, the Mustang. Uh, and, uh, and the Volkswagen bus, you know, that I have, that, that I enjoy. It's, uh, I mean, they're both not really great modes of transportation. They're not 
really comfortable, you know, when you think of the, you know, the leather seats and, and seat warmers and air conditioning and all that stuff. Uh, they, they don't have these things. And yet driving both of those machines, uh, I feel like I'm a, I'm a part of, of the process, you know. I'm part, I mean, it, it's me on the road. It's not the tires on the road, you know. It's Charlie Plum on the road. And so, and so that's, what, that, that's kind of why I, I go back to that. And, and my antique airplane, you know, I have a World War II antique airplane. And uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's simple. It's um, basic. It's not very complicated and, and really not very difficult to fly. But when I'm in that airplane, I feel like I'm a part of it. What is it about flying that's so special to you? Flying is freedom to me. It's, it's uh, you know, no, no lines. You know, I, I, I don't have to be confined to a set of lines like I do when I'm on the road. I, I, I get in this airplane and I go up to five or 6,000 feet at sunset and feel like I'm really a special person. I'm maybe the last guy in the continental United States to see the sunset because I'm higher, you know, than everybody else. <laughs> and especially in, at sunset and, and at night, it's, it's so smooth, the air is smooth, there's nobody else around, uh, you're just, you know, you're, you're just alone with your world. Again, to my mother, when I first got my wings, I came home and she was so proud of her Navy pilot and a, 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 a very religious woman. She said, son, when, you, when you're up there so high in your airplane, do you feel closer to God? And my thought was, silly lady, you know, God's not necessarily up there or, or, you know, or down here. But the longer I live, the more value I see in her question. Because when you're, when you're in the air, you don't see the evil on the ground. You don't see the filth. You, know, you, don't, you don't see uh, the bad news. Uh, from the air, it's all clean and neat. And, and so I think maybe I am closer to God when I'm flying. <laughs> One of the things, one of the interesting things that a number of people here, that we, so much of that we just mentioned to you, is, is they realize, like Phil Butler was talking about, he said, you know, I realized I never prepared my life for the fact that I, I mean, I knew I was a war pilot, and just, I knew the possibilities and the consequences, and you talk about having a set of codes, you were planning out various lives you were going to lead with your life. And, uh, <coughs> you, had a, you had actually pilots turn to elaborate hopes and dreams and plans. One thinks of you, all of you former POWs going into this prison experience and you get out, of, out and life now begins again and everything is great. Actually, that isn't what happened at all. You came out of five and a half years of incarceration and <coughs> a huge shock and defeat that you yet again had to recover from. And, and you did that with compassion. So maybe if we could talk a little bit about you know, this ladder of, of setback. And like it's like sometimes it, you know, it's, we talked about it with mountain. Like it's a false horizon. You know, you, mm -hmm. you get to the false crest. Mm -hmm. You got to go again. Mm -hmm. That's an important part of this. Okay. <clears throat> well, I married my high school sweetheart the day after I graduated from the Naval Academy under the Arch of Swords. My buddies were holding up their swords as we came out of the chapel, and we had a wonderful life together. She uh, is a wonderful lady and was a, a, very, a very great support of me through flight training uh, because flight training uh, was not easy. It, you know, it's, it's, again, it, it's, a, it's a, a tough course and a lot of discipline and a lot of you know, late nights and weekends and all this stuff. And she, uh, she, really, she really was good about that. 
I left the States on her birthday, the 5th of November. I left the United States, and I, I, I'll never forget standing on the deck of the aircraft carrier, looking at, down at the crowd be, below us at Pier 3 in North Island in Ca California, and picking out my wife and waving at her, promising her I would be back in eight months. And I had, I had I really, I had, I had never a thought, and I certainly didn't talk to her about what if I don't come home. You know, it, 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 you know we were 23 years old at the time, 24, and, um, and I didn't prepare her for this because I didn't think it would ever happen. Um, so it went over, got shot down, uh, come back uh, nearly six years later, and she had filed for divorce three months before I came home. She had hung on and been a faithful wife for five years and then found a guy, decided I was probably never coming home, or if I did, you know, would I be a burden to her the rest of her life? And so she filed for divorce. Now, again, that wasn't one of my considerations in a prison camp either, you know. I didn't plan to come back without a wife. So I planned the next 20 years around her. Uh, I had birthday presents and the wrappings and the ribbons. Uh, I had Christmases. I knew every ornament on every tree we would have. I had duty stations. I figured this out in, <laughs> in, in one way. That took two or three months. And then I decided, well, maybe she'll want to go a different way. Maybe she'll want to, uh, to get out of the military. We'll plan that course. Or maybe we'll, you know, I'll go back in and just kind of ride the waves in the Navy until I retire and then get another, another job. And I had these, I had these uh, defined in three fighter pilot terms, uh, saunter, buster, gate are the ways you go to a target when you're gonna attack another airplane. Saunter is maximum conserve. You conserve your fuel and you just kind of coast along till you get out there. Uh, buster means uh, military, full military power Gate means full afterburner. You're gonna go at Mach 2, you know, towards your target. So I planned uh, saunter, you know, would just be kind of um, riding the waves and, and maybe get out of the military and uh, not get too serious, not go back to sea. Buster was going back to the sea, but oh, by the way, I'm home a lot and, and uh, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll go to multi-engines or something where I don't have to, to go back to sea. Uh, gate meant I'm going for broke. You know, I'm going to go be an admiral someday. I'm going to fly with the Blue Angels someday. I'm going to be a test pilot someday. That's gate. And I was going to give her the choice of which she wanted to do. I thought that was only fair. So got back and she had filed for divorce. And, um, and we sat down in a restaurant in Kansas City where she was living. And uh, and she was wearing her big diamond engagement ring, you know, uh, and told me some of the challenges she had faced. And it, it occurred to me, and I truly believe this today, that our wives had more, had, had more pain from the war than we as prisoners of war had. First of all, they didn't know we were alive or dead from one day to the next. Uh, they didn't know if we were ever coming home. And psychiatrists and psychologists in and out of the military were predicting that we would be vegetables, that we would be zombies, that we would need the mental uh, help, uh, mental aid, that, 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 that they, they had our families briefed to institutionalize us for the rest of our lives. I mean, what can you expect, a guy coming back from an experience like that? Um, and so, so when I came home ready to get back on with my life that I had planned around her, um, uh, she went there. And so I had to regroup. And it's kind of like life, you know, it's kind of like my bicycle riding. You know, I, 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 I see the, you know, I, I see the crest of the hill. <laughs> I'm almost there, I'm almost to the top. And I get to the crest and it was, uh, there's another crest and it's higher. And then, oh, okay, well, I can, maybe I can make it to that. And so I pedal hard and, and get up to, 
to that in, 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 in mountain, uh, in, in hiking, it's called a false summit, you know, when you get to the summit, but that's not really the summit. And so, uh, and the same thing with life, you know, being shot down, uh, prisoner of war, okay, and finally things come true. You're finally released, freedom at last, and then you've got a divorce. And so the vicissitudes of life seem to never change. Uh, and, 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 and so, so how do you handle that? You know, I mean, how do you, how do you prepare for that? Um, how do you adjust to it? Well, I think there's a lot of techniques. You know, first of all, you have to believe that even though there's another summit up there, that's really another opportunity. Uh, it's, uh, and, and it was, you know, with the divorce as well, there was value in that separation. She went her way, I went mine. Uh, I met a wonderful lady and we have four kids and three grandkids and, and she is happy in her life. And, um, and, and, and so the, you know, these things actually work out even that while you're going through it, you know, when you, it's, it's very disappointing when you make it to that fault summit and you see that there's another, you know, that there's another goal out there. But if you can really believe that there's value in the process and not necessarily in attaining the goal, um, then makes it easier to do. And years later, <coughs> the years of absence of communication are at that important break. She got in touch with you and uh, sent you some letters. <coughs> and there was a letter you thought very touching and moving from your mom. Uh, sure. <coughs> So when I first came home, I came home from the hospital and had to confront my wife who had filed for divorce. And incidentally, it's kind of amusing in a way that she went to the judge and said, I want to divorce this man. And he said, why? And, he, and she said, um, des desertion, he deserted me. <laughs> And the judge says, yeah, but <laughs> wasn't his fault. <laughs> um, and so he would not grant the divorce when she asked for the divorce. And uh, so she waited for me to come home. And so I wanted her to be happy. And I, I had figured out by this time in talking to my parents how serious uh, the problems were that she had when I was shot down. One of the issues that wasn't a military standard, but it was human nature, is that the ladies who had husbands who were killed or are missing in action or prisoners of war were somehow ousted from the, the, the wives' clubs, you know? They had very strong connections, a very strong support group in San Diego with the, with the officers' wives of the squadron. And they would get together every week and they'd bake cookies for us and they'd send letters to us and they'd, they'd photograph pictures of us. They, they <laughs> one of the pictures we got on the ship was uh, a picture of all these gals in swimming suits, but you could only see from their waist down. And we were supposed to figure out which one was our wife by the shape of their legs. Uh, and so it was fun things like this, that they got together and they did. And, uh, and that support group was very strong because again, you know, they all had the same challenge in life is that supporting their warrior that's in the war. But when one warrior would be shot down, the gals didn't quite know how to, uh, how, how, how to, uh, to approach, how to talk to that person, you know, you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad, you're going to, what are you going to do? And so the, the wives with husbands who were missing in action were sort of ousted from the group. And it was a very sad thing because while her support group was divorcing her, my support group in the prison camp was being built and strong. And so, so she left San Diego, went back to her parents with, with the support group that she had, and my parents were there. And my brother was there, and he was about the age that I was 
when I was shot down. And we look a lot alike. And he would go over to her house to, to mow the lawn in their yard, and she would break out in serious hives, like emergency room. And she, they would hospitalize her for two or three days because she had all these hives because she had seen somebody that looked like me, and, uh, and, and, and she thought I'd come home. So, and I found all this stuff out in the two or three weeks that I was in the hospital from my parents. You know, they, they, they told me the whole thing, and my brother. Uh, and, uh, and so when I met with her in that, uh, that little conversation that we had in the restaurant, I had a great deal of sympathy for her and what she had gone through and really felt that if she had found some joy in life in this other guy, that I'm certainly not going to stop her from, 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 from seeking that comfort. And so I didn't. And so I, I granted the divorce and gave her everything she wanted. And, and um, uh, so I went my way, she went hers. I did not hear from that woman for 43 years. It was amazing. I'd go back to the high school reunions, you know, of all the f mutual friends that we had, and her best friends didn't know where she was. She had disappeared off the face of the earth, and, 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 and I didn't know why. 43 years after that meeting in the restaurant, I get a packet in the mail. I didn't even open this thing for it because I, I didn't recognize the return address on it. It was an initial and her last name, but I didn't know her last name. And so uh, I, I didn't even open the silly thing, and so finally I opened it. It was a bunch of black and white pictures from the Naval Academy. Okay, pictures of me and my buddies and, and, and us doing our thing. Um, in, 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 in the packet was not a word from her, not a word from my first wife, but a letter that my mother had written to her the week I was shot down. And I recognized my mom's handwriting. It was a three-page letter. And about the second paragraph in this letter, Mom says, in, you know, in trying to comfort her daughter-in-law, my mother says, it's so terrible that he was shot down. Uh, you know, my son, your husband, had so much potential to affect the lives of people. Um, she said, but who knows what God has planned Maybe this experience will give him even more potential to touch the hearts and minds of people. So, you know, and I'm reading this, and it's just kind of, kind of startling to me. I was in tears just reading my mother's handwriting because she, by that time she had, she had died. My mom had passed away. Um, and so to see what her thoughts were and what her, what her, uh, instruction might be, you know, to her daughter-in-law, whom she loved dearly. So I, I, there was a return address. I wrote back to her and, um, and, 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 and told her again how I felt like she had it tougher than I did during the Vietnam War. And I apologized in that, in that letter to her that I had not prepared her for that uh, because it was... It was beyond my comprehension, you know. I mean, whoever expects to see that kind of um, trage tragedy in their life, you know, you, you, don't, you don't live your life expecting to have a, you know, a car crash. And so, um, so I apologize to you for that and, and said how I respect her and hope that she has a, a happy life. I didn't hear from her for another six or eight months. I got a phone call from this. I was very surprised, you know, to even to hear her voice. But I recognized her voice when she called. And we talked for 45 minutes or an hour and, uh, and you know, asking me about my life and how it's going and her life. And she was living a very happy life. She's uh, retired and, <clears throat> and she was happy for me and I was happy for her. And... Um, 
But, but I asked her about that big diamond ring that she was waving in my face and that little, you know, to, at, the, at the restaurant that day when we, we did it. So I thought, you know, and by this, I, you know, I talked to her for maybe 45 minutes or an hour before I brought this up, but, it, you know, because I didn't want to, I didn't really want to tap into something personal. But it was interesting. She said, you know, the reason I wore that diamond ring, um, she said, I, I, I didn't want to offend because I, I could never buy her a diamond ring. I, I didn't have the money to buy her a diamond ring. She had some silly aquamarine or some stone like that in her, in her engagement ring. And uh, she said, the reason I wore that was because she said, I was afraid you'd talk me out of the divorce. She said, I kept looking at my ring and that gave me confidence. <laughs> so... But, uh, you know, it's like most tragedies in life. Uh, they, it, 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 they all work out, you know. It's, uh, I mean, it's amazing how you can go through that kind of an experience and, uh, and, and, and work through it and, and be better because of it. And in order to close the loop on how pathetic your mom's letter was, for those that don't know Charlie Baum and know that you speak all over the country, Draw that together and say, this is what I do in my life. Okay. And then what it matter, why it matters to you. The letter that my mother wrote to my first wife uh, when I was shot down uh, was, was quite prophetic. <coughs> the letter that I, um, that I received from my first wife in that packet, the letter from my mother that she had written to my first wife was truly prophetic. In the letter, she said what a tragedy it is that, that my son had so much potential to touch the lives of people. And the next sentence said, but who knows what God has in mind? Maybe this experience will give him more capability of touching the hearts and minds of people. Well, it wasn't necessarily because of that, but when I, when I came home and found out that my message did resonate with people with problems, and one of the first, first things that I did in the hospital, you know, I, I had decided in that hospital, plan the rest of my life, okay? Now, I, I couldn't go through Buster Sonner Gate, you know, because she wasn't there. And so what am I gonna do uh, I hadn't planned on a life without my wife. And so my thought was, I'm going to go to some little town in the middle of nowhere where they've never heard of Charlie Plum. If they have, I'll change my name because I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to forget that nearly six years of pain. Uh, and I really thought that that would be the most, the most valuable course I could take was to try to wipe out those bad memories. Um, then we had a little press conference in a basement at a hospital. I was the first guy back to the Midwest. And uh, a lot of the news media around Chicago wanted to know the story. The POW story was, was uh, draped in, 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 in silence. You know, it was nobody was supposed to talk about it. Our wives were told not to talk about their husbands as prisoners of war which incidentally was another real drawback because she couldn't talk about me or my experience to the media or, or she wasn't supposed to talk to anybody, neighbors, friends, anybody. When the, the, they told, the military told our wives that to talk about us would get back to the enemy and we would be beaten because our wives were over here talking about us. Well, the result of that was that, that that diminished the, the, the little support group that they even had when they couldn't talk about these things. <clears throat> so, I, um, so where was I going with this thing? Um, we, so, so what, what, the prophetic. Oh, oh yeah, the, pro the, the prophetic nature of my mom's uh, letter. So when I found out, um, in fact, in the hospital, when I went to the, when I went to the, uh, uh, to a little press conference at the basement hospital. And I told my story. 
And I'm just telling the story, you know, and this is, okay, this is documentary. This is what happened to me. On the way back up the ele- on the way back up to my hospital room, I was on the 12th floor of the hospital. And I got in the elevator in the basement where the press conference had been. And a young reporter sneaked in just as the elevator doors closed. And I'm nose to nose with this guy. And he has lines of anguish in his brow and tears in his eyes. And he said, Mr. Plum, you really got to me in there. And he said, man, I've had a miserable year. My, my family is falling apart. My job is terrible. He said, I even wondered if I wanted to go on living. He said, you've given me hope. Now, I was, I was taken aback because I hadn't, I hadn't told the story to give anybody any hope. You know, I mean, in fact, it seemed like... <laughs> A story about a prisoner of war would do just the opposite. You know, it wouldn't give anybody any hope. You've given me hope. And it was at that point that I realized that maybe my story would resonate and maybe that there was some value to the pain that I had experienced. And so I wrote a book, my autobiography, and I started to promote that book. I made over 400 presentations the first year I was home. And it validated this thought. You know, of course, I I didn't know my mother's thought at that time, but it validated uh, what what she was thinking when I was first shot down, that maybe this tragedy could be used for something good. And so I started to speak and started to promote my book. And I've spoken over 5,000 times in every state, in the country, in 27 foreign countries all over the world, um, and found that, yes, my message does have legs. You know, that there is, even though, you know, the people I talk to, my audiences will never be prisoners of war. You know, they don't have to know the TAP code. <laughs> they, they, but the principle of surviving and thriving through my experience or anybody's experience in life any challenge anybody has in life, the basics are the same. And so that, so that my mother's, my mother's letter, you know, uh, to my first wife really makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, what a, what a wise woman that she was to figure out. You have to figure that my mother was in a great deal of pain when she wrote that letter. I mean, losing her son. And, um, and, and so to, you know, to even imagine that there might be something good could come from this experience in her own, you know, in her, her own persona. I mean, how, 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 could she, how could she ever even think that there would be value in this adversity, but but she did, and there was. We were talking yesterday, and I was or the day before, and I was saying that I noticed that absolutely the same theme with every single one of your letters and interviews that you've done. There's this breakdown. Reclamation when that first communication comes through. And but over the process of solitary and as you go through all your life, you kind of just scatter all the memories and you kind of lay them out and you look at everything and everything and everything. And then, you know, as George Coker found, you finally, in his case under torture, finally came to this essential core thing. Everything else disappears. I mean, you just have this central core thing. And um, we know that Stockdale was a philosopher, so he called that thing epictetus and stoicism. We know that uh, you're a very religious person, and there's many others who are religious. There's some who are not religious. But I have to say that everyone found a belief in something, a faith of some kind. It doesn't have to be religion. It doesn't have to be, but it has to be. You have to have something that you're willing to stake it all on. That 
doesn't need uh, proof for there to be a threat. Can you talk about that? <clears throat> sure. No, I'm fine. <clears throat> uh, one of the beauties of a military life is you have a purpose. You have things that are laid out for you that you can trust, that you can believe in. And there's never a day in a military life that you don't know why you're, why you're there. You know, what, 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 why, am I, why am I alive? You get thrown into a prison camp <clears throat> and suddenly uh, all that's gone. You know, you, uh, you lose faith in whatever you had faith in. You know, if you had faith in, <clears throat> in yourself, if you were trusting yourself, if you were trusting your wingman, if you, and, and so that sort of disappears for a while. And you're in this kind of a no man's land of, um, of not knowing what to believe, not knowing where to put your faith. And you need that. You need that baseline. And every one of us had to find it somewhere. I personally found it in my religion, my religious faith. Uh, and I had, you know, I had been raised <clears throat> as a Christian and uh, truly believe in, uh, in, in the value of Christianity and in the saving grace of Christianity and in the belief that, um, you know, like the Bible verse says, all things happen for good for those who love the Lord. And if you can really believe in that. And so that was my baseline. And it was really neat when I, when, you know, when I, when I found that because all the material things in life that I had ever taken pride in, my fancy uniform, you know, my big airplane, uh, you know, my wife, my family, my home, all the things that I could feel and touch and, <clears throat> and were real. <clears throat> I think that finding faith in something as a prisoner of war was vital, of course. You know, that, that, that's one of the ways we survived was to find a purpose in life and, a, and things we could trust. And so it, it came almost naturally. I mean, I, I mean, I don't remember making the decision, hey, I'm looking for, for a baseline here. I'm, I'm looking for uh, something to stand on. But, but it, was, um, it was an instinct, really, because when we were shot down, boy, did we have the perfect life, you know? And all the material things that we had, our fancy uniforms, our big, fast airplanes, you know, our homes and our wives and the beauty of life. And suddenly, all those things that we could feel and touch and hear and smell and take our pride in and our belief in and our faith in, <clears throat> disappeared. They were gone. We didn't have the fancy uniforms. We didn't have the, the, the big fast airplanes. We, 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 we were sort of in limbo. You know, we're just kind of hanging out <clears throat> with the... <clears throat> I'm going to put in this plug for your editors. <laughs> trying to edit all that stuff out. <laughs> we were hanging out, you know, we were in limbo. We were kind of, you know, a man without a country here or anything else. And so I found myself searching for that stability, searching for something that I could take pride in, something that I could believe in, something that I could have faith in. And for me, that turned out to be my religion. And, and it was very comforting. 
for me to really believe that there was a God and that, that God had a plan. And I may never know what the plan is, okay? But just the belief that there is a plan, you know, gave me comfort and confidence. Shortly after I was imprisoned, I, of course, started communicating with the other guys, found that our leadership, and primarily Jim Stockdale, came up with uh, a set of rules, set of conditions, and basically a motto. And his communication with us was, every decision you make, every word you speak, every thought you have, should should be should be seen through this filter okay here is the filter return with honor and i'm thinking that's kind of simplistic really uh i mean and, and i mean i mean why why can't i tell a lie you know why can't i deceive why can't i be deceitful why uh what 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 what's the honor thing what's the purpose of the honor within me and of course, I proved to myself over my time in the prison camp and through the rest of my life, the value of honor. And so in those three words, okay, return, first of all, was the assumption that, yeah, we are going to go home someday. And, and that in and of itself, you know, was somewhat comforting that the senior leader is saying, you're going to go home. And the key uh, to go home is to go home with honor. Now, what's this honor thing? What, is that, what does that mean to anybody? Well, each person has a little bit different definition, you know, of what is honorable. They, you know, I mean, there are guidelines. We can, you know, we can talk about the Ten Commandments. We can talk about the 12 points of the Scout Law. You know, we can talk about things that, uh, that tend to, to codify honor. Uh, but still, each person has to have in his own mind, in his own heart, what that definition of honor really is. And so, in effect, Stockdale, in his brilliant leadership, was putting the onus on us. He, he was saying, there's only so much I can do as your leader. Now it's your turn. And you need to act in an honorable way. Because if you don't, if you, know, if, if you don't return, and we have not had honor within our, within our time here, then the rest of your life is going to be spent, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, alone and without direction. And so, and so we all learn that there, that return with honor. And, and we use it today, and I think about it a lot, and, and, and try to make all of my actions, you know, with, with, with everyone be an honorable reaction. Uh, have I failed? Yeah, you know, I, I find certain situations where, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm not very honorable, but then I course correct, you know, I come back to the honorable position because I know that that's 
what that's what survival was. That's what helped us uh, survive and thrive. That's what kept us together was was honor. And and one of the you know one of the things that, that I equate with honor is trust. And I really believe that trust has to be the foundation of honor. You have to trust that somebody else is honorable, and they have to have trust that you are honorable. And if you find someone as a leader, as a leader, you know, and you and one of your followers is not an honorable per, uh, person, uh, you you're never going to be able to establish a firm, um, trusting connection with that person because. You, you can't trust them. They're not honorable, and so I, I, you know, I equate being honest with establishing trust. And I think that once you lose that, once you are dishonorable, once um, you tell a lie, uh, you know, once you uh, don't show up for work or or, or miss a deadline, uh, and um, even the little white ones, you know, even a little white white light now and then is not acceptable if you're going to be a truly honorable person because then everybody else loses trust in you and you just can't work a team when you can't trust people because they're not honorable. Okay. Because he's such an important, um, and and if you could touch upon the backdrop that um, one of the reasons Fred was so severely tortured was he was a huge um, PR coup for the Vietnamese. If, if they could, as a black man, get him to be the voice of Black America, saying this was an unjust war and the Vietnamese were, so he had enormous pressure on him and was went to the rack again and again and again. And yet, in this circumstance where there's another, and we don't need to necessarily identify his name and maybe that's what's okay. appropriate, but there's this other young black man who's saying, who climbed the party line. And those words he spoke and the emotion they evoked in you and described in that. <coughs> and, and maybe say a little bit about who Fred Cherry is. About what? Who Fred Cherry is. Oh, sure, sure. I lived next door to Fred Cherry for uh, probably a little over a year, and he was in great pain. And Af Af one of the very few African American prisoners of war we had over there, he was Air Force major, and he had an open wound most of the time he was in that prison camp from his stomach over his back and to his uh, um, to the middle of his back. I'm going to say that again. <clears throat> he, because I touched the microphone, uh, he had a he had a wound from the middle of his stomach all the way to the middle of his back that was open and festering most of the time that I knew him. And uh, but w one of the toughest POWs I ever met. Now, uh, one thing that's kind of difficult to understand with the enemy, the North Vietnamese. Are, are very focused on propaganda. That's how the communists live. <clears throat> difficulties in understanding the, the, the communist mind is their focus on propaganda. It was their lifeblood. Anytime I'd move into a new prison cell before I got food or water, it would be a speaker uh, uh, that we couldn't control. It was usually higher than we could reach. And it would blare out the propaganda to us. All the, and, 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 and that's what we fought. You know, that was our, our, our primary def defense. In, the prison was to thwart this propaganda. Well, who shows up in the prison camp but Fred Cherry, African-American. <laughs> in fact, he called himself 
the chocolate-covered cherry, <laughs> which he was. Uh, and so even with all of this misery and pain that he had from his stomach back to his shoulder of open wounds, he had the humor. But he also had the tenacity because in their, you know, their view was, hey, here's a great opportunity. We've got an African-American in the camp and if we can convince him to speak to all the other Afri African Americans of the world, telling them how wonderful communism is and how terrible capitalism is and how, uh, how good his treatment is. And so Fred took torture over and over and over in lack of medical care, over and over and over because he was a black man. And, you know, I, I, I could hear him crying in his cell in pain just night after night after night. And it was really, he never complained. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't going to complain about any of this. He knew his, his state, but he, he, was, he was strong. And he could have had it a lot easier had he gone along with the communist propaganda and agreed with them. They, they, they called him their colored brother. The communists, the North Vietnamese said, you know, Cherry, you're, you know, you're one of us. We have to fight against the white man. You know, that's, that's our enemy. We're not enemies, you and me. We're on the same team. We're colored brothers and we're fighting this white oppression. And so they drilled that into his head, but he, he never accepted it. He totally resisted it. And it just one of the toughest guys I ever met. Okay, so later in the war, probably uh, maybe a year or two before we were repatriated, who shows up but another African-American uh, uh, pilot. He, he, well, he, he wasn't actually a pilot, he was an air crewman. And so they, they used the same technique on this guy. Uh, you're our colored brother, we're both on the same team fighting this white oppression. And if you agree to make tapes and statements about how wonderful the, the communist life is and how terrible these, these white men are oppressing us, we're gonna send you home. Well, this guy bought the line, hook, line, and singer, sinker. He, 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 he thought this was his opportunity to go home. He was a weak guy. Uh, he was not tortured. Uh, he just he just decided that this was an opportunity for him, and so I don't think he ever believed the propaganda. You know that he was on the same team fighting American guys. I really don't know, but he agreed. And so I was in the I was between Fred Cherry and the new guy, and so I was handling the communication between the two. And Fred sent a communication to this younger African-American man. And I wish I had committed that to memory because it was a beautiful, I mean, I had, I had tears in my eyes with this. So I wish I had memorized that communication because it was beautiful and it brought tears to my eyes to see this seasoned, hurting African-American prisoner of war send a communication to the new African-American prisoner of war trying to convince this guy that he had to be part of this team. Now, now, interestingly enough, in the prison camp, we really never knew who was black or who was white until somebody said they were because we couldn't see each other for the most, for the most part. And, but, you know, we, we, knew the, we knew the race of these guys, and so the senior 
black guy is sending the communication to the brand new black guy who is about to accept early release and, uh, and deny the code that we all had and, and really disrupt the unity. It was, that was probably the biggest thing of all was that the guy w wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't part of the, of the group anymore. And the message said something, he, he explained himself and he said, uh, you, know, I, you know, being a little older than you are, I really want to tell you what's going on here. And having been here for five years, uh, I, want to, I want to tell you that So the message that Fred Cherry was sending to Norris Charles, the, the, the two black guys, one a, a senior, well-seasoned warrior, and the other a new guy that was about to capitulate with the enemy, was, uh, was very touching to me. And it said something to the effect of, hey, uh, I, know, I know you're new and you're, you're just learning about this system, but I've been here for five years. Let me tell you what's happening. What hap what's happening is <clears throat> they, their, their sole weapon <clears throat> I did, and I don't care if you want to. I, I don't care. You know, it's, it, this is history, and it's, you know, it's all verifiable. It occurred to me we should have done this at night. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now now yeah. that's 2020 hindsight, right? Yeah, yeah that's actually <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so the message from Fred Cherry to Norris Charles, the, 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 the senior uh, African-American warrior who had, who had done his best and accepted an awful lot of pain to, to to stay true to his code, was trying to pass this along to this young guy who didn't have a code yet uh, and didn't really understand the circumstance. And what it said, and I'm paraphrasing, I wish I could remember the, the exact words, was, um, I've been here for five years and I just, just want to inform you of what's going on. And what's going on is these, the enemy uh, has this great weapon, they think, of propaganda. And they are extracting it from us. And our only defense, the only way we can fight this war in the situation that we're in is to, to deny this propaganda. That's what we have to do. And it's incumbent upon us as two black guys to hold up you know, our end of this bargain because we're the one that's, that, you know, that, that, that's, we're the ones that they're, they're, they're using as their tool. And that's all that you are, is a, is a tool if you accept this and you go home. Well, the end result was that, uh, that uh, North Charles didn't agree uh, with Fred Cherry, and so he came home uh, a, a year or maybe two before the end of the war. But the effort you know, that Fred exhibited there and his strength, even in time of pain, you know, he was still fighting this war, this war of propaganda that we were at. And, uh, and, and, and just in his strength gave us all, you know, a lot of confidence that uh, he was certainly a, a true blue guy with a, you know, with a, you know, with a code that could not be cracked. And if we could, uh, going back to the question of the young person who goes, why should I be honored? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, an answer that, that Orson Swindle gave that I thought was so powerful is look in the mirror. Like, who do you want to be when you look in the mirror? Yeah. And in its own way, it, do you want to be Fred Cherry or do you want to be? No, that's a good point. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
in the end of the day, it's not he got out two years earlier and all that. So it's all pay and everything else, but <clears throat> for the rest of his life. Yeah. So it's in your own way. Sure. That's Draw good. It into that all right. Good point. <clears throat> um, so the two individuals undergoing the same, basically the same treatment, they were both prisoners of war. And one had honor, this return with honor. One had a code, and the other did not. And the one who did not have the code had an extra year or two of freedom that Fred Cherry did not have. You know, he, he was there till the end. Uh, but both of those guys then lived the rest of their lives, you know, having to face themselves. And the challenge that, um, that defined both of them. And so, and, and, and now we're back to the trust issue, you know. How, how can you trust a person who does not have a code? How can you trust that person who, who does cheat and steal and lie uh, and, 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 and really um, slap the faces of everybody there? Because that's the way we all felt. You know, any of those guys, and there were several that accepted early release. And, um, you know, they're, they're obviously no longer part of our group, and we have a very strong community of ex-prisoners of war, and they have not been invited, and they would very much like to be a part of this. And they, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget, <laughs> sitting down on the bus, when we all came back, you know, the president invited us to the White House. And I got on the bus with one of the guys that had gone home early. And I'd been in flight training with this guy, and, uh, and, and we, we were both married, and, and we got together and played bridge together, and we you know, just laughed and scratched and had a good time. And um, he sat down next to me on the bus. And he said, Charlie, I can't understand it. He said, these guys don't want to talk to me. Um, he said, I came home early but then I worked for your release. You know, I, I helped out in all the negotiations. I helped the, your wives you know, go to the, to, to the foreign embassies and, the, and on your behalf. I get no credit for that. Uh, and I said, well, uh, you know, I certainly appreciate your efforts, but oh, by the way, you slapped us all in the face. You, know, you did something any one of us could have, could have gone home early. Any one of us that wanted to sign the confessions and make the tapes and write the letters to the anti-war element in the states could have gone early. And you did it and we didn't. And, and that, that, that makes you just not, not very trustworthy. We, we, we can't trust you because you had the code, the same code we did. We knew what we were supposed to do. And it was not easy, but a lot of us held on to that, that moral compass, and you didn't. And, um, and I haven't seen the guy since. Uh, he, you know, he's pretty much dropped, dropped out. But at, you know, at, the end of, at the end of the day, you, know, you have to look in the mirror and say, okay, who do I want to see in that mirror? Do I want to see a guy that has a moral compass, that sticks by a code, that, uh, that you know, does his best to tell the truth, to be honest, to not cheat, not steal, to, you know, to do the very basic things of life that the rest of us expect and trust? Or are you going to be, you're going to look in the mirror and see the guy that doesn't hold strong to basic core beliefs that the rest of us have? Last night at dinner, you, you quoted, and I, I'm <clears throat> Oh, yeah, it was different. Qualification of a naval officer. I would love to get that on camera. I, I, I don't really think we need to do tapping because I have Charlie tapping in the integrative stuff. So okay. more importantly, I think you're the only one who's talked about that, and I think it's fantastic. So yeah. can you tell us what that is? And, sure. And <clears throat> you can repeat it and remember that. Uh, a number of things 
in my life I was forced to memorize. <laughs> um, I couldn't get out of the eighth grade before I had to memorize the preamble to the Constitution, all right? I, in, in church school, you know, I had to, to learn to be attitudes, all right? At the Naval Academy, there was a lot of memory done there. And I'm, I don't memorize well, you know? It, I, I certainly don't have a photographic memory. Uh, but several of the stuff came back to me. And I had a, a lot of it, I, I, I couldn't just off the top of my head. But it came back to me during the years of imprisonment. And one of the ones that made a lot of sense was John Paul Jones, the father of the American Navy, and his definition for the qualifications of a naval officer. And this meant a lot to me during, in, in, in watching the leadership of the other guys and in trying to be a leader myself. He said, it is by no means enough that an officer <clears throat> I don't know that I have this word for word, so, but I don't think it makes much difference. <laughs> John Paul Jones, the father of the American Navy, said this about leadership. It is by no means enough that an officer of the Navy should be a capable mariner. He must be that, of course, but also a great deal more. He should be the soul of tact, patience, justice, firmness, and charity. No meritorious act of any subordinate should escape his attention or be left to pass without its proper reward. Conversely, he should be quick and unfailing No meritorious act of any subordinate should escape his attention or be left to pass without its proper reward. Conversely, he should be quick and unfailing to distinguish error from malice, thoughtlessness from incompetency, and well-meant shortcomings from stupid or heedless blunder. <laughs> I thought about that a lot, you know, thoughtlessness from incompetency. Uh, it, it, it all kind of makes sense in the real world when you sort of compare what is it um, about a subordinate? What is it about a leader, you know, that has to be quick and unfailing to distinguish these things? So it meant a lot. Charlie wasn't in that camp in the same. That happened in other times, but it would actually, Charlie, you have a good voice. I would like to sing. <coughs> you want me to sing a little God Bless America? Yeah. <clears throat> Hang on just a second. Yeah. You want me to tell that story? Uh, 
we had various levels of resistance. It was, uh, it was a set of rules they call the plums, all right? And, but it had nothing to do with me. I don't know why they call it the plums, but it was several uh, levels of resistance. And, and the first level of resistance were, was refusing to bow to the enemy, okay? The, uh, uh, and it was, you know, you wouldn't think it was a big deal, but of course, everybody was forced to do a low ceremonious bow. Anytime we saw any of the guards, any officer, anybody in the camp, or when they came to your prison door and, and dropped the flap down, we all had to present ourselves and do this very low ceremonious bow. Resistance level one, as I recall, was refusing to bow. And you think, well, that's not a big deal. So you get slapped around a little bit. Okay, but, but what it did was it, it, it showed the enemy our unity because Stockdale could pass the word, okay, resistance level one in the plums. And everybody would stop bowing simultaneously. I mean, you know, I mean, throughout the entire camp, all right, you got 200 guys there and nobody is bowing to the guard. Now, you know, the, the, the maneuver itself, the bow itself wasn't, wasn't So resistance level one, refusing to bow to the guards, and when Stockdale would put out the word and it would go throughout the camp, 200 guys would suddenly stop bowing to the guards. Uh, and, and the importance of that certainly wasn't the action of the bow. The importance of that was the camp commander thought, holy smokes, there's a communication system in this prison camp. There's, a, there's somebody leading this, and it scared them to death just because we weren't bowing. Um, another level of, 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 of uh, resistance was to sing. And, uh, and so, incidentally, resistance level number six or whatever it was, was uh, prison riot. You know, we're all gonna break out of ourselves. We never got to that, luckily. <laughs> but but um, at night especially, uh, and especially when it was raining, you know, uh, and, and you would, uh, you would hear one guy starting at, at, at in cell, and you couldn't really figure out what he's doing. God bless America. And then somebody else would join in. Land that I love. And then two or three more guys. Stand beside her and guide her through the night from the light from above. And, and, and so it started just one guy started singing, and then the whole thing would erupt, erupt in this, you know, in this choir, and uh, it was really, it was really inspirational. First of all, a lot of guys in that cell could sing, you know, and they, they knew what they were doing, and we had harmonizing and and, and all this stuff, and uh, but it just brought a lot of confidence to us, just singing "God Bless America." Can you sing the whole thing? Can you? Can you I have. <coughs> Sure. Because I can edit together your voice with other voices. Is there no, I need a cough drop. I want to clear my throat, <clears throat> but I'll take it out before I say. <clears throat> How come my knees hurt when I sit for a long time? You will. Uh, you know, we're not going to be in the same key, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> if you try to edit this. Yeah, oh, you're just going to put pieces together, maybe. And you know what? That's part of the beauty. Of it. You probably will you know when we sang for the president when we came home? Have you seen that tape? Yeah. Yeah. It is really good. It is, a, it is a choir. And um, wow. when they put us together n near the end of the war, we all got together. Quincy Collins uh, wrote uh, a song. <clears throat> and there were probably 15 or 20 of us are in that choir. And so we got up in front. Um, well, the first guy to sing was Irving Berlin. In fact, he sang God, God Bless America at this. He wrote the song. And, um, and then we got up and we sang the POW hymn, 
written by Quincy Collins. <clears throat> and um, it, it, uh, it goes like this. To God we lift our prayers and sing from within these foreign prison walls where men who wear the gold and silver wings and proudly heed our nation's call give us strength to withstand all the harm that the hand of the enemy captors can do to restrict every life and deprive every life of the rights we know well we are due. Um, hmm. Thee to our God, America, and thee. Anyway, that's that's the hymn that we sang for the president. <clears throat> and if you um, if you Google that, you can find that. And it's uh, it's really very melodic. We were pretty proud. We tried to do the same thing at our forty fifth reunion. And a bunch of old guys embarrassed ourselves in trying to sing that song. We should have played the tape. <clears throat> okay, here's God Bless America. Because you ask. <clears throat> and and uh, this is not going to be video. You're just going to use this for audio? There will be videos as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if I can leave my cough drop in my throat. <clears throat> if you can see that. Okay, well, if you hear it, I can take it out. <clears throat> um, and it would probably better be better standing. I'd be happy to see it, but I... Um, uh, but okay, I'll do it. Change, yeah. All right. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. This goes again. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Do you think you could just sing that last uh, set of stanzas without looking at the sheet? Sure. Great. Just... Yeah, I can help sing the whole thing. <clears throat> you want the whole thing or just the last yeah, stanza? Sure. The whole thing, coming up. <clears throat> this will be the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairie. To the ocean white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Wow. wow. Can you... Uh, <clears throat> Can you put in a little applause there at the end? Or is that, yeah, you, you get it. Yeah, yeah. All the clapping. All right, I'm cutting sound. You know, now we we did the pajamas. Did you want to see those or yeah, me I'm describe? Yeah, I'm going to do that on uh, Monday with you. Okay. We'll come back. I feel like you've done such a concentrated thing here that we'll get the clock and the pajamas and then come back. Okay. 
Sure. sure. It's going to be pale markers. Charlie Plum, Cal State, take three, interview. Do we want to add uh, room tone to this? Uh, or make it as its own file? Let's do it as a separate file. Okay, so I'm going to cut for a second. So you're just going to cut, bank will cut.